Well, hello everybody. We are live again another Thursday here with live with Dr. McDougall and um, today we have a very interesting topic. I know Dr. McDougall has to leave in exactly 45 minutes, but uh, he will give us an overview of cholesterol. Then we have received literally hundreds of questions mm -hmm. and I have tried to condense those questions to the ones that are uh, most general um, and useful to all of you and we will open the chat box later on and do the best we can to address your questions. Dr. McDougall, for those of you who are new to this, these live webinars, is a regular uh, traditional physician that um, sees patients and has seen patients for more than 44 years and he's taught um, medicine in medical schools and written 11 uh, best-selling books and being a guest in radio stations and TV stations. So, Dr. Madugo, thank you so much for making time to be here this week, and we're looking forward to hearing you. Well, thanks, Gustavo, and, uh, and this is my month of my 69th birthday. So, you know, I've, been, I've been at this for 50 years, and in this kind of medicine for 40 years. Uh, so I, I want to talk to you about a couple of things before we get on to a cholesterol discussion. Uh, one thing <clears throat> I want people to know uh, that industry is fighting back, and I'll just show you something here. An industry is fighting back. They have a, a food disparagement law, which means that if I talk negative things about meat and dairy, and et cetera, uh, I can be sued. And uh, the other kind of, kind of interesting thing that came out, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, Uh, there, there it is. I think that's it. Hopefully I got the right thing. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is in The Guardian. The largest U.S. food producers asked Congress to shield lobbying activities. <clears throat> so they have, uh, uh, they, have, they have these checkoff programs that were designed with the USDA and uh, the egg producers and the Dairy Association and the Cattle Beef Association, where the USDA which, as I've told you, is a schizophrenic organization. Mm -hmm. And you try and work for the benefit of uh, people, and they put out the dietary guidelines. But they also work for agribusiness. So uh, they're asking Congress to, to pass laws that will um, make it impossible for people to, to, uh, uh, to file the Freedom of Information Act and get information about the activities that the egg and beef and probably the fish and the dairy industry are, are going at in order to uh, sell their products and the things that they know about the harmful effects of their products, just like the tobacco industry. And I don't know my whole history on this, but my guess is the Freedom of Information Act played a big role in uh, calling big tobacco to the table. <clears throat> so, of course, that worked and all that, you know, that's changed in terms of cigarette smoking. In fact, uh, today it was in the paper that you can't buy tobacco in California unless you're 21 years old. So, um, so uh, big big tobacco was beaten, and big food has done everything they can to prevent a similar demise of uh, their organizations, including including taking the people that run these organizations uh, to hearings uh, in front of the Senate, uh, as they did with the tobacco industry. They tried what seven executives for lying to the public about. The addictive nature of tobacco. Well, you know, the day should come when the same thing happens to the beef, dairy, and egg industries. They should be held accountable in some court of law, some Senate hearings. I don't know what would be, uh, what could or should be done, but uh, they're fighting back. And so they're, try they're trying to get laws passed that would prevent people from finding out about their activities, about their information, and what they're doing. I think that's kind of interesting. There's another thing I wanted to bring you up to date on <clears throat> that's uh, you know, it's one of those I told you so things. Uh, there, there are so many times that I find myself in a position of, uh, of uh, you know, wanting to say I told you so, but then mm -hmm. that's kind of an egotistic thing to say. Yes. Yeah. Is uh, you know, I told I told you that vitamin D <laughs> was dangerous, and you know, every time it comes out in the paper, and I I told you like we talked about last week about heart heart surgery. I mean, I've been telling you about the brain damage and the lack of benefits from treatment of chronic coronary artery disease for forty years. And, and articles come out, you know, almost every week that confirm the things that I've been trying to tell the public for 40 years. And uh, one of them's kind of interesting. It came out uh, Wednesday, so it'd be yesterday's paper. It was in the business, our business section, and it says a jury awards 
55 million dollars in talc suit talc talcum powder and uh so a lady from um uh she had johnson johnson had to pay a lady uh it looks like she was from st louis 55 million dollars but there was another lady uh who filed and won 72 million dollars in february from st louis jury mm -hmm. i don't know and there are 12, 12, 1200 cases pending oh, of uh, <clears throat> talcum powder causing ovarian cancer. And this was known back in the 1970s. Uh, the way I got involved in it, and I'll try and make this a quick story, but you know me, I just kind of get carried <laughs> away. Uh, it was uh, 1978. So let's see, 1978, I was a uh, in my last year of uh, internal medicine residency. And in the newspaper, the Honolulu Advertiser, I was living in Honolulu then, there were all kinds of stories about uh, asbestos in the mm -hmm. schoolroom walls and the shipyard workers who worked in Honolulu were exposed to asbestos and they got mes mesotheliomas and uh, all kinds of uh, lung problems. And uh, so I wrote the Honolulu Advertiser, the newspaper, and I wrote a little letter to the editor. It could have been maybe a paragraph long saying something to the effect of, they're all upset about the asbestos exposure from the uh, from the walls in the schools and from the shipyard workers uh, in Honolulu who worked during World War II and have all these asbestos-related diseases, I said, uh, why don't you tell the public about uh, the fact that uh, rice is coated with asbestos? And what we used to sell, what I mean by this <clears throat> is uh, uh, rice used to be sold, white rice, as talc-coated rice. And talcum powder, talc is uh, magnesium silicate, and it's just the amorphous form. And so you mine magnesium silicate. And when you mine it, you know, you can mine deposits that are more amorphous and they call it talc. But the fibrous form is called asbestos. And you can't mine the amorphous form without mining the fibrous form. In other words, you know, uh, millions of people were eating, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of ton tons of asbestos. Every day, and I asked the Honolulu Advertiser, you know, to publish this as a letter to the editor. Well, they came back. Well, actually, they said nothing, and I didn't hear any response from my uh, letter to the editor. And finally, I called them a month later, and I talked to uh, whoever was head of uh, the editorial section, and I said, "Why won't you publish this?" And they said, "Well, because it's not true. It couldn't possibly be true." And I and I said, "I'll send you all the articles about talc and asbestos and ovarian cancer." and mesotheliomas, I'll send you all the, all the information. So I sent them all the information <clears throat> and they did nothing. So I called them back and I said, why aren't you publishing this? And the guy said, well, we're just not gonna cause that kind of hysteria in Hawaii. So I went and I talked to the editor at that time of the whole newspaper and I got him on the phone and he was nice enough to talk to me. I don't recall his name right at the moment, but we talked and one of the things I said is, is I said, are you a newspaper serving the community? If you are, I gave you the evidence that people are eating tons and tons and tons of asbestos every day on talc-coated rice. So anyways, they sent one of their reporters out to do a story. And the reporter talked to the rice company and they said, this is all BS, that uh, we don't have asbestos on our rice and it's not important and on and on and on and on. You know? And so what I did, now remember I'm a senior medical resident with two children and Mary the four of us are living on $12,000 a year. You know, that's, that's what I got paid as a resident. So uh, this, this gives you some idea about my nature, which hasn't changed in almost 70 years now. But right. what I did is I went to a, a chemical analysis company in Honolulu, and I said, uh, this was the story. There's asbestos in the talc that's put on the rice. The reason they do that is, by the way, is you take the brown rice, you strip the, uh, the coating off the brown rice, and now you've got the nugget of white rice, which is exposed to vermin, you know, all kinds of insects and bugs and, you know, will eat it. And so what they have to do is coat it with something. So they coated it with talcum powder. And uh, the idea was that you're supposed to wash the rice before eating it. You know, it's just that was just common practice. Nobody knew why. You're just supposed to, right. and then, of course, they fed the rice water to babies. That's that was one of the. Oh my goodness. Well, anyway, <clears throat> I, I went and hired this uh, chemical analysis company, and I think I had to, you know, they did like ten thousand dollars of research for me for like eighty dollars or something. <laughs> well, what they did is they went to the uh, they went to the grocery stores in Honolulu, Hawaii, and they bought 
uh, several brands of rice and they looked at uh, the uh, the rice and analyzed it and found it was loaded with asbestos. And then what they did is they uh, wash the rice as your instructor commonly did and with each washing they got more asbestos yeah it was kind of interesting because you know the first washing just took a little oh, wow. bit off and the next washing took even more and so i sent the report to the honolulu advertiser this was this took me a year by the way this was probably 1979 by then i sent them the report i said here i've shown you the scientific studies i have uh you know the most respected uh, analytic uh, chemical firm and Hawaii, who has analyzed the rice in Hawaii, they show, showed you that there is asbestos in the rice. I said, now what are you going to do? Well, what they did is they said, oh, we will give you an entire page to write your story oh, in the Hollow wow. Advertiser. And I have it someplace. I, I, I didn't uh, put Mary through the trouble of trying to find uh -huh. it. But they gave me a whole page. And so I wrote a whole page about uh, what the things that I just told you. And what happened is... Uh, <clears throat> After that, I mean, immediately after that, all talc-coated rice disappeared in Hawaii, California, and Puerto Rico. Ooh. In other words, they completely banished it. So it was the first time that I realized one person could make a difference. Could make well. a difference. But I, but I also want to tell you, as I as I locked my doors and I shut my blinds, I mean, I was really scared. <laughs> right. When I, when I did that, so they they stopped serving any putting. So what they put now is they put sugar. They coat the because the vermins won't eat sugar either. Oh, okay. So they, they coat the rice with glucose with sugar when when they took the asbestos. But it's kind of interesting. Here we are, forty years later, and uh, you know, one woman got fifty-five million, another got seventy some million dollars, and there are twelve hundred more women with uh, ovarian cancer are suing because ovarian cancer increases uh, or talc talc, it maybe the asbestos part of talc increases the risk of. Um, Ovarian cancer, they say by 40%. I don't remember, but I tell you, I've got a file in my basement like this thick talking about the scientific studies on rice, talc, asbestos. Oh, I probably right. even have the original report down there from this, uh, right. from this uh, analytic company. I guess, but, it's, yeah. I guess this shows that the industry it just hasn't changed. No, they won't, they won't stop. They really don't care right. about the customer until they're forced to do something like this newspaper article right. I wrote in 79 made them stop doing that uh, in terms of the rice. And maybe this lawsuit will uh, no longer will you take talcum uh, baby powder and spread it all over your baby or, you know, they sell it. They sell right. it in the stores as some kind of, you know, cosmetic product. And, uh, you know, people, maybe they'll pro probably talc will be a, uh, banned, uh, I would guess, from the stores because of the lawsuit. It mm -hmm. should be. And maybe they're taking that kind of action now. But the only way that you can get these people to react, you know, the meat dairy industry, uh, telic industry, sugar industry, whatever, the only way you can get them to act is to uh, publicly expose them. And with this uh, story I just told you a couple of minutes ago mm -hmm. about the checkoff boards uh, going to Congress trying to get a law so we can't get information to expose them. Uh, it's it's just an ongoing battle, and uh, it's just business, ladies and gentlemen. It's not a conspiracy. It's just plain and simple business. And as I told you, and I know I've told you this in the past, uh, I've, I've been talking about this for 40 years. I think I've also yes. told you that uh, Barry Obama used to be one of my students when he was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. I taught at Punahou. <clears throat> His name is Brock, but he used to go by Barry. And I actually had a couple conversations with him personally. Uh, about these whole issues. Uh, I, I didn't know, of course, he was only 15 years old, what his right. future would be. But I do remember him because he was the only black kid in Punahou High School. All the oh, others were white and Asian. <laughs> so, so anyways, it's been 40 years I've been talking about. It. There are a lot of other people that have joined the Army, you know, including right. the people who are listening here now uh, on the webinar and the people who take our newsletter. You know, you, you've joined the Army. And uh, we just got to we just got to fight the bad guys, you know, just like we fought tobacco and we've uh, fought big alcohol and big heroin and we've got to fight big dairy, you know, big food. Mm -hmm. uh, not only for our own lives and our children and our spouses and our friends, but, you know, we have a planet to save. And I get more and more people who are writing me these days saying things like, you know, I get it. <clears throat> you know, even though I may not be able to do it myself completely, I get it that uh, we've got to stop this because livestock is uh, the, if not one of the most important contributors yeah. to planetary destruction. And that it means is. the cows you're eating and the milk you're drinking and so on. 
So uh, the awareness is rising. The only question I have, you know, we're we're going to win, what, but what are we going to have left when we win? I mean, right, is there going to going to be a world for my grandchildren? I have seven grandchildren. Will they have a world worth living in, or any world at all? Uh, industries fighting hard to make sure we don't. You know, the fossil fuel industries, uh, mm -hmm. the mining industries. I mean, we could go on and on. There's every there's somebody right. in your life. What is in the paper today? Uh, 86,000 people are fleeing Alberta fires. 16,000 homes have been uh, destroyed just over the last couple of days. And this, of course, is all the effect of global warming. The major impact that we can make, like today, is to change the food. Right. You don't eat the beef. Uh, you don't eat the bacon. You eat uh, the brown rice or, or the beans. And uh, <clears throat> that can make as much difference. That can change the impact on the environment as much as 100-fold, 100 times switching from say beef to potatoes. Uh, so it's not like it's a little thing for you and I and the community to do your church groups, your you know school groups or whatever you know your rotary to talk about or whatever. It's not a small thing. I mean this this is huge and it impacts it everybody. Is. It is well, it's, <laughs> yeah. especially today when we're talking about cholesterol the animal food is the only place where right where cholesterol is uh that, that's that's pretty much the truth. I, I can give you a paper, and it's cited in the Starch Solution that shows that there is cholesterol in plants, mm -hmm. but it's so minuscule, so insignificant, it's, it's it's hardly worth talking about. It. But if you want to be absolutely correct, the uh, cholesterol sterol does a, uh, appear in plants, but you know, uh, as far as it, uh, the the amount and the significance, it's basically zero in yeah. plants. Right. So <clears throat> cholesterol, cholesterol. Um, is a uh, is a sterol it's a ring structure uh when i talk about uh cholesterol you should think about it as a waxy substance and when i talk about triglycerides that's fat like when you stick chicken soup in the refrigerator you get this layer of fat on top that's the difference between cholesterol and triglycerides is they're completely different substances triglycerides are chains of carbon uh, 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 excuse me, uh, triglycerides are chains of carbon uh, into fats, and uh, cholesterol is a ring structure. Uh, it's kind of a waxy substance. But people who have high cholesterols also often have high triglycerides. It's because it's the same common denominator. It's the food that gives you the diabetes, the obesity, the constipation, the triglycerides, the, uh, the cholesterol elevations, the LPA changes, uh, the HDL, the LDL, I mean, all that stuff. I mean, you could get so confused, and people do. And part of that confusion keeps them from uh, taking action. Uh, well, my total cholesterol is high, but what's my HDL? What's my LDL? What's my uh, uh, lipoprotein particle size? And I mean, it, it gets so so complex, I, I can't even keep up with and don't try. And many doctors and the patients just kind of throw up their hands and say, this is too complicated. Well, general. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not too complicated. Um, as you started out uh, speaking, uh, the, the bottom line is very clear, and that is cholesterol is uh, synonymous with animal foods. It's really only present in eggs and fish, fish and shellfish and uh, uh, you know beef and pork and cheese and so on. That's where you'll find it. In fact, if you look at the cholesterol content based on calories, say based on 100 calories, you find that fish and chicken have more cholesterol uh, per 100 calories than do uh, beef and pork. So it used to be when I was uh, a younger doctor, I don't know what they teach these days, but they probably people believe the same thing and teach the same thing. They say, well, if you wanna deal with the cholesterol intake problem, you switch from a beef and pork to chicken and fish. Well, that's absolutely untrue. And all the studies published show that your blood cholesterol remains the same when you make that change. And if you were to make it per 100 calories instead of by weight, which is what they do, you'd even uh, get a higher cholesterol level eating chicken and fish than you would beef and pork. So don't kid yourself, folks. Uh, you know, whether it, uh, whether it happens to wiggle, wiggle a fin <laughs> or flap a wing or move, move a leg. How it moves. Uh, you know, or, or comes out of a chicken's butt. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, all, or it's, 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 it's all the same stuff. I mean, these are all animal foods, which are just not plain and simple design for people. Right. Right. They're great for cats. Uh, they're great for lions and tigers, and, and you know dogs do okay. They're omnivores, but uh, human beings are herbivores. But they're very resilient herbivores, so you get away with eating that food. You don't die suddenly, and so you get fooled. 
All right, so uh, <clears throat> you can see you know where, to, where the cholesterol comes from. And um, Hansel Key showed that eating saturated fat, uh, even, even coconut fat, will raise blood cholesterol levels. Uh, so that, that's always been implicated. They kind of been tying saturated fat and cholesterol together. Well, saturated fat is synonymous with uh, dairy and eggs and beef and pork and not, not fish. But uh, so they're, they're, all, they're all basically the same things. So, uh, so I wouldn't get confused too much with the numbers. I take care of people with triglycerides. Remember, that's the fat. That's those chains of carbon. Triglycerides uh, are often that are 300, 500. Sometimes I see them at 1,000 or 2,000. Normal would be below 200. My record is a uh, fellow had a triglyceride of 5,500. We were able to lower him to 700, by the way, in, in 10 days. Uh, <clears throat> so we get great, great drops in triglycerides and people who have high, high triglycerides. Overall, the triglyceride change in our group, you know, well, 1,615 people is basically null. There's no change. Uh, my, it would lead me to believe that uh, some of the people with really high triglycerides that maybe drop three, four, five hundred points, uh, they balance out a slight rise in triglycerides that I would, I believe occurs when you go on the kind of diet I recommend. It would probably be a two or three point rise. Well, that's normal. Uh, I could sort out that data. I haven't done it, but I would guess so. Uh, when you first start eating the McDougal diet, uh, because you like the food and because there's a lot of food and a lot of calories, mm -hmm. sometimes triglycerides will go up a little bit, but they kind of even out in time, say three or four months. If you want to lower your triglycerides, you want to focus on, remember that's the fat, we're not talking about the cholesterol, <clears throat> but they're tied together. In fact, they run around together in packages called uh, lipoproteins. If you want to lower your triglycerides, you can eat less food, you can eat less uh, simple sugar, even fruit and fruit juice, you can stop drinking alcohol. Alcohol has a big impact. You can exercise. Uh, you can lose weight. Sometimes initial weight loss translates into higher blood flat fats, triglycerides, because the fats coming out of the body fat going into the blood fat. All right, so I cleared up triglycerides for you. Uh, I don't, do not treat them with medication ever. Uh, I used to treat it with niacin. Niacin is effective, but uh, the uh, adverse effects of niacin with in increasing strokes and other adverse effects. I don't use niacin anymore. I, I don't use the uh, uh, fibrinates. Uh, this is a, a class of drugs that's specifically sold for uh, lowering triglycerides. Uh, fibrinates, I think that's the right, right way to say it. Uh, the, these drugs are just so dangerous. Uh, they lower the uh, triglycerides, but uh, they increase the risk of uh, cancer and uh, other other serious problems. I'd have to review all the reasons why I don't, but you could go. I, I never prescribe these medications. I will sometimes prescribe statins when people have high triglycerides because they lower them a little bit, but mostly I prescribe statins if I do for the cholesterol issues. So let's leave the blood fats alone for a minute, the triglycerides. Mm -hmm. Remember, right. they run around in packages with cholesterol, and when you eat the American diet, you raise both. All right, so let's go to the cholesterol, which is that sterol, that ring structure molecule. Uh, we make that <clears throat> molecule ourselves uh, as animals. We synthesize it from plant sterols. Plant sterols being similar ring structures that you eat with plants. Uh, we convert that into cholesterol for our own needs. Uh, we need cholesterol to make sex hormones, to make vitamin D. So we need cholesterol, but we make all the cholesterol we need from plant foods. You don't have to eat any more cholesterol. Uh, the problem is, is we have a limited ability to get rid of cholesterol. So we can get rid of all we can make, you know, we either utilize it or we excrete it through our liver into our bowels, and we can get rid of all we make. But we can't get rid of the extra that we eat. Some people can, but most people can't. So say you make 500 milligrams of cholesterol in your own body. Say you eat 500 milligrams more, and the liver only has a limited ability to get rid of it. It has to store that extra cholesterol. And it stores it in the arteries, all the tissues. In the skin, you get uh, xanthalomas, which are uh, or xanth xanth xanthalomas. Yeah, they're, they're kind of like, you'll see people with white, kind of, they look like waxy deposits under their eyes. Uh, they'll get uh, uh, deposits of, uh, uh, of this in, uh, cholesterol in their um, tendons. And sometimes the tendons will rupture. It deposits in the skin. It deposits every place. And when it deposits in the artery walls, it causes sores. And these sores rupture, and uh, they form blood clots, as we talked about last week, and give you heart attacks. 
So anyway, we have this limited ability to get rid of cholesterol because our liver has a limited capacity. However, a dog or a cat, they have a, a, a no, no limitation. So you can feed a dog or a cat or other carnivorous and seriously omnivorous animals, you can feed them cholesterol egg yolks all day long and their blood cholesterol won't go up because their liver is so efficient. So Gustavo, what's your conclusion? Your conclusion, your conclusion is we were born with the wrong kind of liver. That's or, right. Or you could say you shouldn't be eating like dogs and cats and lions. I mean, that's the other conclusion. Um, well, when you were saying that, I was thinking that I know a couple of people that must have a different liver <laughs> yeah, might, because I, they eat all this uh, stuff yeah. and they have low cholesterol. What happened? Well, they, they are some people who are efficient. They either don't absorb it or they more rapidly excrete it. But there are people who are, are better able to handle cholesterol, but most people aren't. I mean, you look at people of uh, the age 60, 70 years old, 80% uh, of them have cholesterol deposits in their arteries. Right. You know, so it affects most people, and cholesterol is involved as a co-carcinogen. In other words, it's involved in the process of developing cancers. <clears throat> and it's, so it's not just the, the damage to the arteries or the deposits in the skin. All right, so let's talk about uh, cholesterol numbers. Um, Let's talk about this magic number that people keep bringing up, the 150 or less that can make you a heart attack proof. Right, and, and, and just to change things uh, for our international listeners, to go to international units, you divide by 38. Oh, okay. Okay, so that would be four international units or 150 milligrams per deciliter. And I won't make the conversion again for you, uh, but just you just divide by 38 and you convert to international units. Uh, <clears throat> What, what was the question again? What so, the, yes, the, the, the magical number seems to oh, be. Oh, 150. Okay, that, that came. Actually, I was probably the first person ever spoke that, that I know of. Which would be 3.94 in international. Yeah, about four. <laughs> yeah, about four, sure. Uh, I, as far as I know, uh, at least on a public manner, is I, I was the first one to use that number as a, a guideline, like a getting an A on your report card. And I got that from the Framingham study, which is, a guy named Castelli, uh, he wrote uh, that they never saw a case of heart disease in the Framingham study with a cholesterol below 150. This is Framingham, Massachusetts, a, a big study that was done for many years. And I read that someplace and heard that actually from William Castelli speak one time. And so I publicized that number, but it, it, it uh, got more, uh, more credit than it deserved. Uh, it's just like an A on a report card. It kind of reflects uh, you eating a good diet, that's what it should reflect. It may reflect your ability to uh, excrete cholesterol, which is good. Uh, there may be very few heart attacks with cholesterols below 150, but I don't think it's true that uh, nobody has ever had a heart attack with a cholesterol right. less than 150. I, it's just like <clears throat> if you go to school and you get an A on your report card, that indicates that you learned the subject, but you could have cheated or you could have a photographic memory like me and you could just remember <laughs> things and, and, and you can just put them down on paper without understanding them. Right. So it doesn't really mean <clears throat> as much as people are told that it means, but it's okay because everybody likes to have something they can kind of hang yes. their hat on in terms of a goal. And you can use a cholesterol 150 as a goal. Uh, most of my patients, I would say, most of my patients can achieve that. On a personal level, um, about the time I had my stroke when I was 18, I had my cholesterol checked at 22, and my cholesterol was uh, over 335 milligrams per deciliter. Mm. Uh, uh, but I but I deserved that the way I ate. I mean, I yeah. ate, I ate well, just like all the other other of my friends, I ate a lot of cholesterol. It just affected me more. My grandfather, he had uh, intermittent claudication and really died of atherosclerosis. My dad died of heart disease. Uh, so I have a very strong family history of heart disease. Of course, I had a stroke at 18. <clears throat> even my doctor, when I was 22 and got my cholesterol checked, even my doctor at that time said, don't you think that's a little high? And I said, no, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, just, to, just to give you some peace of mind, I've had my cholesterol checked uh, over the last, well, over the last 20 years. It's been about the same, but I've had it checked on at least four occasions in the last two years, because we have the lab right there at the right, clinic, right. and my cholesterol has run between uh, 151 and 137. Uh, uh, and I think that's within laboratory error. That's the mm -hmm. way it's been, the highest 151, the 
lowest 137. And that's simply with dietary change. I do not take any statin medications or any medication to lower cholesterol. That's simply from diet. So All right. If, so yeah. if someone has 150, do they do they need to care whether what the level is of the LDL or the HDL or just the total? I think so. I think just like I say, I get very confused by doing all these subfractions and particle mm -hmm. sizes and so on. So if I get confused and I'm a board certified internist, I'm supposed to be an expert in this. Uh, I, I can't. I can only imagine you get confused. I know. Yeah. So I, I would pick something, and I think total cholesterol is good enough. You could pick uh, LDL or bad cholesterol, and people say less than 100 is good and less than 70 is ideal. You could do that if you wanted, but let's just let's just do it with total cholesterol because, you know, like I say, I'm, I've been doing this for 50 years, and that's all we did back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, the truth hasn't changed, and it's not going. You know, the problem with all these subfractions is this: is just just as you brought up, is people come in, they say, well. Um, you know, my cholesterol is 150 and I eat the American diet, so I don't have to change. Uh, uh, and that's not true. You, that's not true. Or, or they come in and they get a cholesterol of 280, and the doctor says, well, your good cholesterol is 100. And the patient says, well, see, I don't have to change because my good cholesterol is so high. So it kind of takes people in, in with, with both extremes, either a good cholesterol that they don't deserve because their body just happens to have good metabolism, they're going to get you know, colon cancer and diabetes and be fat and all kinds, maybe they won't die of a heart attack. Uh, <clears throat> so it, it really, uh, it's a disservice to people to, uh, I think, to look at these subfractions and to get any consolation from them. If you eat the American diet, regardless of your cholesterol level, you need to change. You shouldn't get any, um, any uh, uh, peace of mind uh, from this particular number, but everybody likes to get numbers. I just told you my numbers, oh, obviously. Right. Yeah. I like to get numbers too. Mm -hmm. So what do, you, what do you do? Well, uh, this is a judgment thing. This is all guessing. Believe me, if, if some doctor says they know or you're a stupid person for not following their advice because they know, just step back and say they're only guessing. They're just guessing based upon what they've learned and what they believe the research says and so on. So my guesses kind of go like this. Uh, and by the way, this is in my May 2013 newsletter on who should take statins. Oh, so yes. you can not only read that, but you can also watch a great interview that John Aberson, who's the world's expert on cholesterol, gave in my May 2013 newsletter. So my thinking goes like this. And remember, I see you know hundreds of patients every year personally. I, I do personally see my patients at the clinic. <clears throat> and uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll take into um, I'll take into uh, and to issue all the things I know about the patient to make the best guess. This is just a judgment thing. And I, and I tell people <clears throat> that I'm only guessing, but you, you ought to be paying for my guess because I'm a good guesser. I, you know, I've been at this for 50 years and, I've, right. and this has been my passion. So even though I'm guessing, it, it's worth your money and time to get my guess, but I could be wrong and, I'm, and I know I'm wrong sometimes. But the way I kind of think about when I see, see a person with, uh, I see their cholesterol level, I get some consolation if it's low, say 180, 170 below 150, I get some consolation. And it's usually in people who already eat good, but there's that rare person who's just, quote, lucky. Uh, I, I get trouble when cholesterols get, uh, you know, say above 220, 230, you know, it, it, it gets my attention. But I, but I don't prescribe statins based on that number at all. And I also see people with cholesterols of 300 or 350. And of course, everybody's upset. The doctors are upset. The patients are upset. You know, uh, I don't get upset though, because it's happened to me too many times. I, particularly in women, maybe in a man, I wouldn't feel this way. In fact, I probably wouldn't. But I've had at least a half a dozen uh, women in my practice with cholesterols over 300, and we've studied their arteries with uh, uh, CAT scans. There's heart scans, and we found their arteries to be perfectly clear. So uh, cholesterol doesn't always reflect uh, what the artery damage is. And of course, these six women got great uh, comfort in the fact that their arteries were clear on scan, but they still need to eat a rich diet. And in all, all six of these uh, women that I can recall, um, most of them did not take statin drugs because they made them sick. But I think a, a couple of them did. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, you've got to make that judgment. If your arteries are clean and you can get a CAT scan, it's equivalent to, I believe, 3,000 chest x-rays. <laughs> but you, you can get a CAT scan and have your arteries checked. Uh, that maybe give you some consolation, but you, you're still just plain and simple need to change your diet. Now, who do I put on statins? 
Uh, I put out people on statins who I think are at high risk of having an event like a stroke or a heart attack. Now, why do I think they'd have a high risk? Well, one thing would be age. And I believe the numbers are between uh, uh, age uh, 30 and 65. Uh, some people say all men in that age group should be on statins. <clears throat> so uh, in that age group, you would consider that uh, a reason to take statins. As I say, the Cochrane Collaboration and other groups uh, take that age range for men, say everybody should be on statins. If you're a male, you know, men have more risk of, uh, of uh, heart attacks, so I'd be more concerned about a statin level, or excuse me, a cholesterol level in using statins. Uh, <clears throat> if you're postmenopausal, I, I'd be more concerned because once you go through menopause, uh, and don't take this wrong, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, uh, God only likes women who can reproduce. Uh, in other words, once you go through once you go through menopause, you're no longer protected from heart disease and you have more risk of cancer and bone disease and so on. It's just a joke. It's just a joke, okay, when I say that. Uh, but when you're in your reproductive years, uh, your risk of a heart attack is quite small as a female. And uh, so I, I consider a gender and I also strongly, and this is probably the most deciding factor that I use as to whether or not I recommend statins as to what their past history has been. You know, have they had a heart attack or heart surgery or a TIA? fancy an ischemic attack, like a little stroke, mm -hmm. or if they had a stroke. Uh, believe me, if I would have had a stroke this day and age, I would have been on statins. Right. But because back then we didn't have statin drugs, you know, I was just, I wasn't told anything about diet. I wasn't told anything. I was just kind of released myself from the hospital and <laughs> we, don't know, we don't know what caused it. And, you know, even though they did an angiogram on me, they uh, studied my brain arteries and saw a ruptured plaque. Uh, any, anyway, I would have been on statins, but these days I would have put myself on statins too. Right. And I would have strongly recommend a good diet. And so <clears throat> using those and probably other uh, different criteria, I, I try and put together a, a mental picture for me. And also what's important is how the patient feels. The patient may say to me, you know, I, I just don't want to take those drugs. Or they may say, I've taken those drugs and I've gotten severe muscle pain. Uh, which is a common side effect, or I'm just afraid of them, or whatever. And and what the patient thinks is really, really important to me. Uh, statins have side effects, and one of the major ones is they do cause uh, muscle damage. And about, uh, oh, somewhere between 4 and 10% of people who take them have muscle pain. But if you study the muscles with uh, very uh, sensitive chemical tests, uh, and you, you uh, look for uh, damage to the muscles, of the people who don't have pain, which would be the other 90%, you can show evidence of muscle damage in 70% of these people based on sensitive chemical tests. So essentially everybody who takes statins has uh, tissue damage going on. Right. Well, what, what you have to do and what the whole doctor game is about, anybody who tells you different, you know, especially if they're a general doctor like me, they're full of themselves, they're lying to themselves. It, it's all about trying to put everything together and make a judgment and make a best guess. Uh, and I do that and I tell my patients when I get prescriptions, I say, you know, I hope I'm making the best guess. I hope I do you more good than harm. I hope six years from now we can say I did you more good than harm. But my best guess is you should not be taking statins. Or I may say, because they've had a heart attack or whatever, I, I would say, you know, I think you need to take statins. And I'll tell you one other thing I, I think about too. And again, I'm often wrong about this is how likely it is for this person to adhere to the dietary advice that I'm giving. Because the overall picture, I'll just tell you, if I had to guess, the benefits from statin in terms of reducing the risk of heart disease is very tiny. The, the diet is really the, the issue. And if I give somebody a prescription for statin, they were sitting across the table from each other in my office, and I hand them a prescription for statins, and my favorite statin is Pravastatin. It used to be called Pravacol. Uh, rarely I write for Lipitor, I never write for Crestor. There are reasons why. Mostly they do more, uh, it's, it's a harm benefit ratio. Uh, and so I usually use Pravastat and I hand them a prescription and I say, you know, I really think you ought to be on this. And I do, I, I don't, don't joke yourself, I do prescribe these drugs for people. I'll hand them a prescription <clears throat> and uh, I, I know some of them look at me and they say, well, you know, McDougall, if you believe so much in your darn diet, you wouldn't be giving me drugs. And I worry that I do harm to patients by, uh, you know, by giving them prescription, to mm -hmm. be quite honest. Uh, I do harm to their attitude and the resolution to follow a diet. Or like they say, some people, what they do is they, they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
a, a, a double A omelet and they just say, I'll take an extra Lipitor. Right, right, exactly. Well, well but, what, what you said earlier, Dr. McGurl, it would, what, if someone follows uh, this diet um, yeah. and it's compliant, really, let's take that case that it, 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 it someone is 100% compliant. Right. And so, and the arteries are, the, their arteries are healthy. I mean, then does it matter if the cholesterol is a little bit high? Well, you know, I, I don't treat the number just in the sake of number. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I always recommend a good diet. It would be a, a good motivator if they saw high cholesterol to eat a good diet. So uh, in answer to your question, I, I, I don't use cholesterol, the actual number, as the only or main factor in making that decision. Okay. Uh, but I, I do. Uh, and, and I thought you were going to ask, what are our results? Well, we have results. I had published one paper on 500 people over a 10-day span, and I published another paper in October of 2014 on 1,615 people. Our average cholesterol in seven days, the average drop is 23 points, 23 milligrams per deciliter in seven days. That's with no medication change. And then we have the OHSU study done uh, with a one-year span mm -hmm. uh, where we check cholesterols uh, and followed people. 85% of the people followed the diet 100% of the time. Uh, we know that. And we're about, by the way, we're just about ready to have full acceptance of the paper, I think within the next two days, mm -hmm. and it will be published in a journal soon. I can't tell you when, but it's finally after three years we're getting that paper published. But the uh, overall drop in cholesterol was over 19 milligrams per deciliter uh, in all participants in the diet group maintained for one year. Uh, and these people weren't even interested in cholesterol. They were interested in multiple sclerosis. They were much younger than our average patient. Our average patient, I think, is 54 years old whereas our MS patients were like uh, 36 years old. Uh, so uh, they were less concerned about cholesterol than the average person is, and yet they maintained a, about a 20-point drop in cholesterol for a year. And uh, as I say, they achieved, uh, you know, b b uh, our overall achievement is, is uh, 23 points in seven days. And those who start out with a higher cholesterol, in other words, the sicker you are, the better results you get. Right. So say you started with a cholesterol of uh, 240, your drop may be 38 points instead of 23, 22, 23. Uh, th right. Those are the results we get. I remember dropping 50 points when I attended your 10 day in program seven days, yeah. in one week. Yeah, one week, that's not unusual. Of course, this is real important to people. Uh, they get uh, very upset even though, you know, they may come in with a low cholesterol and I tell them their cholesterol is not gonna go up or, or on a rare occasions, very rare occasions, they'll stop the statins when they first come in and, um, Usually I don't stop until the last day because I want them to see numbers because numbers are so important to them. Uh, it, it is very disappointing for somebody to spend uh, the money they spend to come to my program and to, uh, to go through all the effort of learning and eating new things and then not to see a giant drop in cholesterol. And I know that made you feel real good when your cholesterol dropped 50 points. Mm -hmm. And of course, we all smile too. And almost always it does drop. Uh, as I told you, average uh, uh, over 22 points. And, and it's good. It's, it really makes a nice relationship. But in that person, that rare person, maybe one person in every program, uh, the cholesterol may not go out, drop or it may even go up a little bit, even though they may have lost uh, five or six pounds, uh, may have gotten all their off all their medications, et cetera. When the cholesterol goes up, they get upset. But I'll tell you, they get more upset if they don't lose the five or six pounds. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's a number with some rewards, but some deception, and uh, you know you really just gotta focus on the diet, and secondarily you must judiciously use medication if you think the benefits will outweigh the harms at the end of you know six years or six months or whatever, and that's just a guess, just a judgment. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. I don't know what, I, I don't keep up with media, but people are asking here, can we discuss what the findings were about the biggest losers? So I don't know what, oh, what sure, the sure. is about. You know, I've only read a little bit of that, but what, what I've read, and I, I should do a report on it, is, uh, you, you know, every one of you watching this probably knows more about the story than I do, so don't expect a great... Yeah, I don't uh, know any about uh, it. But what, what I mean, the biggest losers, there's this TV program, and like they lost... Uh, 56 kilos or something, uh, the biggest losers that won for the last several years are average of 56 kilos, and they gained back 33 kilos. And, uh, you know, so most of them gained back their lost weight, and they're blaming it on their metabolism, all kinds of things. I know why they regained the weight, because they lost it by doing really 
uh, unnatural things like heavily exercising or going on high protein diets. And you just can't maintain that. I mean, I don't have the time to exercise like that to lose weight. Uh, to burn off a hamburger costs like 500 calories or an hour's worth of running. Uh, so I understand why the biggest losers are the biggest failures. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, maybe I'll get a chance to read the whole study and talk to you about it you know, in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's, that's the, the takeaway I get. The takeaway you get from the newspaper articles is these people have special metabolisms. The takeaway I get is they lost the weight by doing unnatural things like exercising four or five, six hours a day or whatever uh, and eating, starving themselves and eating weird diets. If you want to be thin, stay thin, eat good food, there's only one way to do it, and that's to eat the traditional human diet, which is a starch-based diet, which kind of brings me to 1145. Yes, <laughs> I know. So uh, I know you have to go, but we I, have, I have, a little, uh, I have a little surprise for the viewers. We're going to show one of your early years videos. Yeah, let, let me just say one more thing before yes. we do go. We do have May 13 and 15. You're coming to the uh, weekend. We do have a, a few spots left for the weekend, not many. We have well over 100 people coming. That's in Santa Rosa, California. You go to the website to look that up. We have a June program coming up. We have an advanced study weekend in September with some great guests. I'll talk to you about them in the weeks coming up. Really, really phenomenal guests. And uh, we run 10-day programs throughout the year, and Mary's taking us back to Kauai in January. So just to give a, a, a little uh, a plug for uh, some of the opportunities that we have to offer before you show the video, just go to the website. It's all there. And I know we'll see We'll see you at some, if not most, of those things, Gustavo. Yes. I Just one quick question. Have you ever had a child attend a 10-day program? Uh, we have. We have. Uh, uh, when they're really young with parents, we've, uh, we've had several 18-year-olds uh, come by themselves, 16, oh, 18-year-olds. Okay. Right. But most of them come with their parents. Uh, there's right. no sense. I mean, a three, four, five-year-old is not going to no. for the program. No. But there are some very, 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 very sick young children that need the program. I just got a letter from somebody who has a 23-year-old grandson with a kidney disease, and I know we could cure, but the kid was told that he's going to end up on, a, on dialysis, and it's easy to cure. And we see little kids all the time with kidney problems or ball problems, Crohn's disease, things like that. But their parents come along with them to learn right. the diet because they have to control the food. Well, thank you, Dr. Well, Mitchell. Pleasure. We really appreciate it. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed it. And uh, Next week we have Dr. Lyle. We uh, do. Um, he's going to actually take live questions, so this is going to be a very interesting webinar. And I'll, and I'll be back with you in the next week. And in the meantime, uh, you know, very good. Bye. Thank uh, you again. Spread the good news. We have a world to save. We do. Okay. I'm going to set up the video for people to um, watch this uh, special three-minute video here. Hold on.
Well, thank you again, everybody, for logging in today. Dr. McDougall has to had to leave, so I'm uh, just going to remind you of a couple of things. Next Thursday, Dr. Doug Lyle is doing uh, going to be our guest in the webinar. This is a very unique webinar because he's not going to be doing a presentation. He's actually going to be taking questions and. Uh, talking about things like, I mean, is there really a food addiction? How can I control things like that? And how how can I succeed in a all plant based diet? It's going to be very informative. So I hope that you will be with us next Thursday. And um, next Friday, the thirteenth is the three day uh, program uh, in Santa Rosa with Dr. McDougall. It's like the ten day program, but everything is compressed in three days, and I'll be there. I hope to meet many of you there. And then in June, he is doing, Dr. McDougall is doing an actual 10-day program. Everything is on the drmcdougall.com website. And one thing, extra um, value today, is that there is a free webinar tonight um, that I will be doing with Chef AJ. And very interesting uh, topic uh, is called How to Cook for the Week. Uh, many of us here are very busy people and we don't have time even though we would like to to cook every meal at home and eat them at home um, so chef aj uh, is uh, one of the best most distinguished all plant-based um, chefs in the nation and she's going to be showing us live from her home how to cook for the whole week so that you can actually succeed and it is a free webinar and to sign up for this webinar um, you need to go to her website which is eatunprocessed.com and I'm just going to type it here for you just go to www.eat let's see eat and process.com and um, if um, if not just send me an email at um, my regular email which is um, well I have several actually you can send it to Gustavo at Gustavo Tolosa.com and I can send you the link and if you can't attend it I would still sign up for it because if you sign up then you can um, receive a link to watch it later i'm sorry i just see that i made a typo since i was mm, typing it too fast instead of a two that's supposed to be the at sign so that's the email very good it was a great webinar i know we didn't have enough time to answer all the questions there were literally hundreds of questions and hopefully dr mcdougall will be able to do another cholesterol webinar another time and we can bring more questions but i think he covered a lot of the questions that most of you had well thank you very much and i'm gustavo tolosa here from dallas and you all have a great day and i will see you next week. Bye-bye.